everyone. I'm Mady Amini, CEO of United Legacy, and I am thrilled to welcome you to episode 16 of Behind the Curtain. Today, we're going to break down and analyze some of the significant financial developments of the first quarter of 2023. Despite news of a looming stock market crisis, the facts tell a different story. The S&P 500 and the Euro stocks 50 have been showing robust performance and we're going to dig into what's driving these strong numbers. In the realm of real estate, we'll explore how apartment vacancies have rebounded to pre-pandemic levels and discuss the evolving landscape of rent growth across major U.S. cities. We'll particularly focus on the Midwestern markets where rent growth has been exceptional. However, it's not all good news, as well also cast a spotlight on the struggling rental market in the Bay Area where growth has been slow. In the commercial real estate sector, we face a colossal challenge, the maturing of billions worth of loans. As we face the wave of debt and rising interest rates, we'll dive into what this could mean for the industry. So join me as we pull back the curtain on these intriguing developments. Let's get started. S&P 500 finished the first quarter up 7%. The S&P 500 is poised to deliver impressive returns for Q1 of 2023 with an increase of nearly 7%, following a 7% surge in Q4 2022, despite news reports suggesting a stock market crisis, the actual situation differs significantly. While the stock market returns in America have been impressive. Europe has outperformed exponentially with a remarkable 13% increase this quarter, following a staggering 25% return in Q4 of 2022 for the Euro stocks 50. These remarkable returns rank among the best in history, yet news outlets are portraying the situation as a crisis. Beneath the surface, the story is somewhat different with a majority of stocks experiencing a decline of 30 to 50%. The reason for the increase is attributed to the exceptional performance of just two sectors right now, the information technology and healthcare, which amount to 40% of the total weight. These sectors have been responsible for driving the market up and include leading companies such as Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, Facebook, Tesla, Johnson & Johnson. Bianco Research reports that the year-to-date gains in the S&P 500 are being sustained by just eight stocks. The remaining 492 stocks have collectively this last quarter experienced losses. Will the second quarter of the year tell a different story, stay tuned. As you guys know, last year in May and June, we saw significant losses in the market. Apartment vacancies back to pre-pandemic. As we extensively research over the last few months, the surge in rent prices during 2021 was primarily attributed to a constrained housing market where a greater number of households were vying for fewer available rental units. When the pandemic initially hit in 2020, the vacancy index rose to above 7% as Americans merged households and relocated to live with relatives due to the pandemic's economic disruption and unpredictability. Subsequently, there was a swift upsurge in household creation, resulting in a significant reduction in vacancy rate, which finally hit a low of 4.1% in autumn of 2021, 
Since hitting a low of 4.1% in October 2021, vacancies have trended up steadily. The current vacancy rate nationwide is 6.6%, matching the average rate from 2018 and 2019. This trend is expected to continue as new apartment developers are currently building 1 million apartments, the highest amount on record since the early 1970s, specifically in areas like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Tampa, Florida are seeing a surge in vacant apartments with landlords struggling to find tenants. Las Vegas has been their vacancy rates go from 2.5% in 2021 to over 8.3% today, more than triple the pandemic low. Phoenix has more than doubled going from 3.2% to 6.6% vacancies. Tampa, Florida has also tripled, going from a low of 2.6% to 7.3% today. As the number of vacant properties increase, it may eventually become challenging for property owners to cope. Consequently, some may be compelled to sell their homes. However, a substantial increase in the number of properties available for sale will be necessary to drive down home prices and restore the real estate market, returning to pre-pandemic levels nationwide. This process would go a long way in bringing back stability to the market. Twenty-eight of the 100 largest U.S. cities have seen negative year-over-year -year rent growth through March 2023. According to ApartmentList.com, the year-over-year -year rent growth rate has decreased to 2.6% compared to 3% last month, signifying a continued deceleration. This is the lowest rate of the growth since April 2021 and is similar to the level of rent growth observed before the pandemic with an average of a, about 2.8% between 18 and 2019. The current rate is expected to fall further in upcoming months as rent growth is anticipated to be slower in the first half of this year compared to the previous year. On the other hand, a significant number of cities have experienced a drop in prices since last year. Currently, 28 out of the 100 largest cities are showing negative year-over-year -year growth, up from 25 cities last month. This includes cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles, which have recently dipped into negative territory. The most Substantial decline was seen in Scottsdale, Arizona, with prices falling by 5.4% since last March. The West Coast has been particularly affected by price declines, particularly in the Phoenix and Las Vegas metros, which have started to cool down after a surge during the early pandemic. Midwestern markets have seen the fastest rent growth over the past year. The Midwest, home to the top three metros with the fastest year-over-year -year rent growth, with Chicago leading the pack at 6.3%, followed by Indianapolis at 6.2%, and Cincinnati at 6%. Additionally, Columbus, Kansas City, St. Louis, also make the top 10 making markets in the Midwest potentially attractive to those seeking affordable housing options. This is particularly significant given that many previously affordable Sunbelt markets 
have experienced significant spikes in rent prices over the past few years. However, it's worth noting that despite the impressive year-over-year growth rates in these Midwest markets, the rental market has been experiencing a cooling down period. The current growth rates, while still impressive, are relatively modest compared to the rates seen in 2021 and the first half of last year. For instance, in June of last year, all but one of the 52 metros with a population over 1 million had year-over-year growth rates higher than Chicago's current 6.3%. Furthermore, over the last six months, no large metros have seen rent prices increase. Tampa has been and seen 39% rent growth over the last three years. San Diego, Phoenix, and Las Vegas saw 29% in the same time frame. Slowest metro level rent growth, the rental market in the Bay Area is currently struggling. As mentioned earlier, San Francisco year over year rent growth has turned negative this month. And this trend is affecting not just the city, but the broader Bay Area region. Among large metros, only six have experienced negative year over year growth. And Bay Area rents are still 4.5% lower than they were in March of 2020. The only metro where rents are still discounted compared to the onset of the pandemic. The San Jose Metro, which is adjacent to San Francisco, ranks second for the lowest growth over the past three years and fifth for the slowest growth over the past six months. The already weak tech industry, as we talked about, is now further affected by the collapse, and we told you here, Silicon Valley Bank, a crucial lender for Bay Area startups. As a result, a strong rebound in Bay Area rents is unlikely in the near future. Following San Francisco and San Jose, the rightmost column of the table, mainly consistent other expensive coastal cities such as Seattle, Washington, DC, Boston, Los Angeles, New York, Despite experiencing a rebound over the last year and a half, these markets had relatively modest rent growth throughout the pandemic. However, only five metros have had rent growth below 10% since March of 2020. It is worth noting that the table also indicates that some of the markets that experienced the fastest growth in the recent times have now cooled off rapidly. Similarly to the city level data mentioned before, Las Vegas and Phoenix have seen the most significant declines in rent over the last 12 months. Even though both cities still rank among the top 10 for the fastest pandemic era rent growth. This is the time that we all need to pause and take a look at the information. If you remember the stock market, in May, this time last year, what happened? How much did you lose out of your retirement account? We're now facing and looking at numbers across the nation with rent growth. We're taking a look at appreciation versus depreciating uh, our properties. What are we going to do? What is your game plan going into 2023, into the third and fourth quarter of the year? And what are you doing to protect yourself and your family's legacy? This is the time we want to bring you the information when it comes to real estate and capital markets as we've seen 10 consecutive rate hikes by the feds now uh, in the last 13 months. Uh, we're hoping and praying that this is the last time they're going to move the rates up, but what's going to happen if they do that again? Well, 
again, we're going through the rental markets, not only in commercial real estate, but the residential market is, you know, we need to build a wall between the commercial and residential market. And one thing we have to look at is the rents, because a lot of assets are owned by you, the real estate investor, and you have to debt service uh, that asset. And if interest rates are now double or triple what we saw in the previous years, it's going to be harder and harder to debt service. In fact, we're going to talk about commercial real estate next. Let's build the wall between speculating or talking about commercial real estate and speaking about residential real estate. Commercial real estate, you know, during the pandemic, uh, living and residing in California, I was taking a look at the space of hospitality that got really hit, senior living. We already were taking a look at affordable housing and the supply demand of America and very specific areas needing more rental markets, but the commercial market was at a turning point. You know, we started seeing a lot of the um, strip malls being converted into multifamily, office space. We just experienced a pandemic. In fact, um, I believe when Elon Musk took over Twitter, one of the first things he didn't do was pay the rent and wanted to go back to the negotiating table. So many companies all across the United States of America started debating whether or not individuals were going to return back to work or were going to work from uh, home. These are major questions coming up, but what a lot of individuals don't see behind the curtain, and I do as leading um, American Mortgage Bank, as we were doing commercial and residential mortgage banking, is that there wasn't lots of options for these short-term loans on these commercial assets for even billionaires to refinance. A lot of the term sheets that we were seeing were through institutions like Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank. Right now, and these numbers are staggering. In fact, I saw some numbers as low, up as high as $1.5 trillion by the year 2027 of real estate commercial loans coming due. That's a major issue if the government doesn't get involved in backstops. And it's going to really impact these investors and these assets in these specific areas. $500 billion and commercial real estate loans are maturing. Let's shift our focus to commercial real estate market. Recent headlines in finance and banking have centered around the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. But the commercial real estate industry faces a more persistent issue Upcoming debt maturities, this problem is expected to have a significant impact on the industry and our country, with experts like myself suggesting that the level of maturities coming due in 2023 is already problematic, and the wave of maturing loans in 2024 and beyond could further intensify the issue if interest rates remain high, which they are going to, while the commonly cited number of commercial real estate debt maturities is $447 billion. Data from TREP reveals that this figure is just the tip of the iceberg. An estimated $486 billion in loans are anticipated to mature in 2024, and I don't see an exit. And beyond that, more than $500 billion in loans are scheduled to come due in 2025, 2026, and 2027. As I was explaining in the pandemic, we couldn't 
get loans for a Hyatt Marriott or Hilton asset with billionaire sponsors getting a rate better than what they had. These figures don't even include the debt originated by private lenders. According to Scott Morse, managing director of, we've heard him, Citadel Partners, the amount of corporate debt coming due could potentially peak over $1 trillion, which is higher than the peak of $900 billion in 2012. This situation has made it challenging for traditional lenders to offer help with refinancing as higher rates limit the loan proceeds they can afford due to minimum debt service coverage ratios, as we explained earlier. Many analysts explain that this has led to a longer-term issue where borrowers may be unable to refinance their debt if interest rates remain high, and you heard it here, interest rates were low during the pandemic time. And again, Hyatt Marriott hotels and senior livings wouldn't even debt service. The problem of commercial real estate debt maturities began after the great financial crisis when the Federal Reserve kept the effective federal Funds rate near zero, causing a surge in commercial real estate loans. Many floating rate loans with three to five year terms were funded at a cap rate of four to five percent. But interest rates have more than doubled since then, making it difficult to refinance these loans at current loan underwriting levels. The COVID 19 pandemic has also impacted commercial real estate, particularly we've seen the retail, as we just mentioned, the hospitality and the office sectors, leading to lower rental and occupancy rates, worsening the issue of commercial real estate debt maturities. The recent collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank have made interest rates highly volatile potentially leading to a more complex capital stack. Experts agree that the issue will persist beyond 2023. A significant number of loans are set to mature by 2027, and many predict declining asset values due to the Federal Reserve's intention to increase interest rates to combat inflation and the bank failures. So think about it. Which banks hold the most commercial debt? That's what I would do next. And who could be in trouble over the coming months and years as these loans come to maturity? And is the government going to bail them out? According to the latest data, Wells Fargo currently holds the highest position in commercial real estate loans with over $144 billion in debt. J.P. Morgan Chase follows in second place with $131 billion in commercial real estate debt, and Bank of America holds nearly $70 billion. Other notable banks in the top 10 include PNC Financial, Capital One, we all got it in our pocket, Financial, U.S. Bank Corp., M&T Bank, New York Community Bank Corp., and Citigroup, each of which holds between about 40 to 50 billion of real estate debt. There are three main ways in which these banks are invested in commercial real estate. Firstly, they directly purchase and manage properties and become commercial real estate equity investors. That's what all these private equity firms did Let's see how they end up. We call them the shadow banks, but these banks are doing the same. Secondly, these banks are originating and acquire commercial real estate loans and become commercial real estate debt investors. Lastly, they invest in property or mortgage REITs, which engage in either of the investment methods. However, a significant problem lies and the fact that commercial real estate debt investors are highly concentrated 
with small banks holding over 82% of the commercial loans valued at over $2 trillion. If a wave or when a wave of default occurs, the U.S. banking sector and its stakeholders could face significant financial challenges. So how did this concentration come about? In 2022, U.S. banks significantly increased their exposure to commercial real estate, raising their investment four times faster than the previous years. It's a big number. The primary reason for the surge was the expectation of interest rate hikes, which prompted banks to make extensive investments in 2021 when interest rates were at zero. The commercial real estate market is being affected by prevailing market forces. The recent hike or hikes in the effective federal funds rate, the EFFR, to 4.8% from zero in mid-21 has a significant impact on the commercial real estate loans. These loans typically come into two types. In commercial real estate, we either have a fixed rate or a floating rate. A rate hike can negatively impact the net asset value, the NAV of both types. For fixed rate loans, bondholders, and this was the problem with the banks, right, continue to receive a low coupons while the market rate has increased by over 480 basis points. This results in a decrease in NAV for investors holding these loans. For floating rate loans, a rate hike can significantly affect the cash flow of tenants who are now required to pay higher interest rates. And why we started talking about year-over-year rents. If tenants default on their payments, the default risk skyrockets, which can result in a decrease in NAV for investors holding these loans. In summary, the recent rate hike can negatively affect NAV of both fixed and floating rate commercial real estate loans. It is essential to keep an eye on these potential risks when investing in commercial real estate market, I advise not to. So what's ahead? Most likely, cascading defaults. So far in 2023, in February, Brookfield, number one largest office owner in LA, defaulted on $784 million. In March, Pacific Investment Management defaulted on $1.7 billion of mortgage notes in seven asset classes. In addition, Blackstone defaulted on $562 million in European commercial mortgage-backed securities. And just last week, Arbor Realty Trust multifamily arm, Arbor Multifamily Acquisition Company, which owns and operates over 8,000 units and has acquired more than 1.75 billion of multifamily properties across the United States of America, defaulted on four different multifamily apartment complexes, totaling 230 million. Basically, due to the mismanagement by the asset team who raised over 70 million from investors to do these deals. The syndication made several mistakes that contributed to their troubles. Firstly, they opted for a floating rate loan as rates were low at the time, which led to the mortgage payment hikes when interest rates rose rapidly. Secondly, Rent collections decrease as some tenants stopped paying or 
They might have been doing re, uh, uh, repayment uh, modifications. They also underestimated the cost of property insurance and taxes, which increased by 40% and 20% respectively. Lastly, the rising interest rates compelled them to purchase an interest rate cap, adding to their financial burden. Meanwhile, the White House has proposed new regulations for the regional banks that do not require congressional approval, potentially leading to tighter credit standards and reduce access to credit. What's going on here, folks? The full impact of these changes is currently unknown. Several CEOs in the commercial real estate industry are advocating for regulatory programs that collaborate with borrowers to create responsible and constructive refinancing plans similar to those implemented, as I mentioned, in the 2008-9 financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. These programs would offer additional time for the markets to stabilize and allow the private sector to responsibly manage the deleveraging necessary to adapt to the new interest rates regime. If the Federal Reserve fails to provide further financial assistance, it is likely that an economic crisis similar to the savings and loan crisis in the 90, 1980s will occur. This, we can expect more bailouts from the Fed to prevent unnecessary economic turmoil. We've heard it. We talked about bank runs. It's happening. Some of these depository banks were working as, it seemed like, venture capital firms. What's going to happen to the private equity firms that invested so much money in real estate? Well, I'll tell you, it seems like we are up for a great reset. It looks like how we see the world today is going to change, how we see the world in the future, how we bank, how the government is involved, real estate assets, our mindsets, all has to change. This is a time if there's a great reset happening in the financial system and in real estate that you have to have a plan on how you're going to protect your assets. We're going to later talk about digital currency and how the government is involved in that and what different states are going to do to handle that issue. But again, if you look at the office buildings and the commercial real estate in downtown San Diego and downtown Honolulu and San Francisco, all across the nation, these buildings are empty. And no, you cannot convert them into multifamily and you can't just change these real estate assets because they have billions of dollars worth of loans on those assets and they don't debt service and they couldn't debt service even at a 4% rate during the pandemic level in commercial real estate. A lot is about to happen right now. This is not fear-driven as I'm speaking to you. I wanted to get a lot of our data together to prompt you that usually in May and June, major breakthroughs happen in the financial sector and in real estate and within your financial wealth management firms. And right now is the time that you got to get elite advisors to give you the best advice. So I do want to mention that, um, you know, we founded a elite advisors referral network where we're bringing the best of the best, um, inspired by United Legacy um, and many different leaders that we'll introduce to you. But we want to bring the elite CPAs, the elite wealth management companies, the elite commercial real estate experts, the elite alternative investment experts. Because I can tell you one thing, when we're looking at investments right now, and we're talking about commercial real estate or residential real estate, you've heard it here at United Legacy that the best thing that you could do is not be the investment property owner or the commercial asset loan, uh, uh, owner, but be an investor with a trustee that secures that asset and you are now collecting 10% returns. That's what we're getting you positioned to do in a market like this where we're always talking about losses and not gains. If you got a 10% annual 
return, and let's say on $400,000, in 7.2 years, that $400,000 is going to be $800,000. What if I can tell you that you can set up a self-directed 401k, take your money out of that, or take your money out of your commercial real estate asset and invest into trustees that will double your money in 7.2 years. All you need is a 10% return. So as we go through a lot of numbers in commercial real estate, we talk about the, the U.S. banks, when we talk about private equity firms and we give you all this data, the point of this is to make sure that you don't lose your principal. What we all can't afford and what we all have on our minds is we don't want to take losses. Well, it, it, a lot of people didn't take losses in the market for the last 19 years. They didn't take losses in the real estate market. They didn't see interest rates go up. So the fear wasn't here in the markets. But when I did my lectures across the country last year, everyone's eyes started opening up. And now today we are believers. We know that something is occurring. We know the reset is happening. We know we have to be repositioned. And we need an elite advisors network to help us decide by looking at data and making smart, wise decisions, by not fearing what's about to happen, but putting an action plan together. We're here to help you do that. It's an honor of mine to be able to be here with you today and just to make this the, the first of many messages that are going to get pretty aggressive coming into this uh, 2023 uh, year and going into 2024. I appreciate you guys listening. U.S. dollar reserve currency under attack. As the world continues to evolve, significant changes are being witnessed in the global economic landscape. In recent times, more countries are exploring the option of conducting trade using their own currencies instead of the U.S. dollar. This shift has resulted in some notable developments, including Saudi Arabia's potential acceptance of the Chinese yuan for oil sales, China and France's first successful liquid natural gas trade in yuan, and Russia's consideration of the yuan as a reserve currency. Furthermore, several countries, such as China and Brazil, have already agreed to use the yuan for cross-border transactions, and Saudi Arabia has formed a trade alliance with several Asian nations to reduce reliance on the U.S. dollar. The percentage of global reserve held in U.S. dollar has decreased from 72% in 1999 to 59% today. If more countries shift to conducting trade in their own currencies and may decrease the demand for the U.S. dollar, potentially resulting in a weaker dollar. Why is this happening? Well, the short answer is the U.S. sanctions. U.S. sanctions have contributed significantly to de-dollarization. When the U.S. imposes sanctions, it restricts access to the U.S. financial system and the use of the U.S. dollar in international transactions. This forces those targeted to seek alternative currencies and payment systems, such as the euro, the yuan, and cryptocurrencies, maybe even the FedNow cryptocurrency, right, to conduct international transactions. The threat of potential future sanction has also led to countries and entities reducing their reliance on the U.S. dollar and diversifying their currency reserves, further accelerating the de-dollarization trend. However, this transition is likely to be a long process. Given the central banks currently hold 60% of their reserves in the U.S. dollar, and 80% of foreign exchange transactions are still conducted in the U.S. dollar. Despite the potential for a weaker dollar, it is not necessarily a bad thing. A weaker dollar can boost exports, attract foreign investments, 
reduce debt burdens of other countries who have borrowed U.S. dollars and can boost tourism. In the upcoming months, we will closely monitor these developments as they represent significant changes that have not been witnessed in over a century. Make sure you stay tuned here to Behind the Curtain as we will keep you updated as these events on the U.S. dollar unfold. OPEC announced 1.6 million barrel per day cut. The world is currently facing a major energy crisis, and this week the situation became even more severe. OPEC's recent announcement of surprise cuts of an additional 1.6 million barrels of oil production per day has caused a widespread concern and speculation. In this context, questions have arisen regarding the reasons for these cuts and their potential impact the global energy market. To shed light on this issue, let's dive deeper into the details and explore the possible reasons behind this decision. The announcement of these cuts came as surprise to many, with several major oil producing countries such as Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, making significant reduction in their oil production. Some have speculated that this move could be a response to the sanctions imposed by the United States of America, while others have suggested that it may be linked to the Biden administration decision to draw down the strategic reserve in an attempt to combat high gas prices. Remember that when he came into office? However, there is evidence to suggest that these cuts are part of a larger trend in the energy market, as Russia has also reduced its oil production to Europe by 500,000 barrels per day after the European Union imposed price caps on Russian oil. Furthermore, Russia's natural gas exports have also decreased significantly due to the shutdown of the Nord Stream pipeline. The impact of these cuts on the global energy market, the wider ec economy, is significant. Higher energy prices are a major contributor to inflation around the world, including in the U.S., where the inflation rate of energy is nearly double that of all other categories. The short-term rise in crude prices is particularly concerning as it is not in line with U.S. goal of reducing inflation. As a result, these cuts are likely to have far-reaching consequences both for the energy market and the global economy as a whole. Recent developments in the global energy market have raised concerns about the possibility of energy being weaponized against the United States and its allies. Some of us have speculated that the timing of OPEC's surprise cuts in oil production could be deliberate strategy aimed at undermining U.S. energy security. To understand the context behind these cuts, it is important to review the history of the U.S. Strategic Reserve, the SPR, and its recent utilization. Established 50 years ago, the SPR was designed to protect the U.S. economy and strengthen national security during times of oil supply disruptions. Over the years, it has been utilized multiple times in response to crises such as the Gulf War, 
Hurricane Katrina, and the recent pandemic conflicts in Russia and Ukraine. However, President Biden's decision in 2022 to make the biggest ever withdrawal from the reserve, drawing over 220 million barrels of oil to fight inflation and geopolitical conflicts, has left the reserve with only 375 million barrels of oil, the lowest level since early 1980s. The U.S. efforts to refill the SPR have been complicated by recent developments in the global energy market, including OPEX, production cuts, and rising oil prices. Last October, President Biden announced that the U.S. would refill the SPR with oil purchased at or below $67 per barrel. However, shortly after their statement, OPEC's decision to cut 2 million barrels per day led to a significant increase in oil prices, making it difficult for the U.S. to refill the reserve. Despite lobbying for the U.S., OPEC did not increase production, and as the Fed began to raise interest rates, oil prices started to fall again. However, Russia then announced production cuts, and just as oil prices approached the desired level for the U.S. to refill the SPR, OPEC announced its surprise cuts in oil production, pushing prices back up over $80 per barrel. These events have led to speculation about the possibility of energy being weaponized against the U.S., particularly given the pattern of production cuts coinciding with drops in oil prices. Every time oil prices fell within the desired range for the U.S. to purchase oil for the SPR production cuts were announced, causing prices to rally again. This raises the question of whether these cuts are a Consequent, uh, a coincidence, or a deliberate attack, I would think, on the U.S. energy security. Ultimately, it is up to the individual interpretation. But the timely pattern of these events do raise major concerns with me. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mady Amini, CEO of United Legacy, and I'm delighted that you've joined us for episode 16 of Behind the Curtain. We've tackled some substantial topics today, from the unexpected resilience of the S&P 500 and Eurostox 50 to the impressive return to pre-pandemic levels of apartment vacancies. We've dived into the trends of rent growth in major U.S. cities shedding light on the intriguing dynamics at play, particularly the accelerated growth in the Midwest against the challenges experienced in the San Francisco Bay Area. And let's not forget the iceberg that is looming large on the horizon of commercial real estate sector. The upcoming wave of maturing loans worth billions and going into the trillions. While we've covered a lot, it's important to remember that understanding these financial issues in America today, whether it's about real estate or your wealth management accounts, is not a destination. Don't get pump faked. But it is an ongoing journey. I hope our decision and discussion by tuning in today has brought you valuable insights and encouraged you to think more deeply about the world of finance and real estate. I'm eager to continue our journey next time as we uncover more of what's behind the curtain. Until then, stay informed, stay curious, and above all, stay resilient. Goodbye for now, and thank you once again for joining us.